Hello again and welcome to Match Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. Thank you for tuning in. I didn't um, even sound like I'm sure if I know who I, I, I am I think today. I'm Carla Garrick. <laughs> It's, uh, I haven't had breakfast. Well, we're going to blame it on, I'm going to blame it on the weather because now we're in this, um, shock of winter because, you know, it's the middle of January and this is what it's supposed to be like, but who would have thought we'd have like summer for a weekend? It was lovely, you know, and I just kind of feel like, I I mean, you know. It melted all the snow. I was so happy. It melted the snow. It was nice to just get that little break where you're outside. We played with the dog. I I did a little gardening. I know. I was like, I took down my Christmas lights that were on my shrubbery, you know, things yeah so, so it was, it was a very nice respite thank you very much mother nature for that little yes. little tidbit <laughs> to get us through january because you know it's almost spring almost it, you know what i mean it no, is january is just about point, over and then february know? doesn't really count because it's such a short little month and by the time march is here you might as well call it spring See, See, we're I'm just being optimist. positive. There we go. We just did away with winter, That's right. folks. <laughs> just don't, just don't acknowledge it. Um, so, what's happening in so the world? No, nothing happening in the world, right? Um, you had mentioned to me prior to this. Um, there's a new education funding commission. Which is weird, because I was like, what is that? And I, what? I mean, I'm sure it's just going to be bad. I mean, it is ba- bad. Based on the article that I read in the Union Leader this mm-hmm. morning, I mean, it sounds like they've appointed this new person who's going to try and figure out how to legislatively fix all the mess from Claremont right. and all well, of those and decisions and sort of figure I out. I was very involved in that whole, um, in the education adequate you know, defining an adequate education. I worked for New Hampshire Advantage Coalition at the time. Um, I was their executive director back then. And that was one of the first issues that I worked on was the whole adequate funding and how, you know. So it's your fault, Tammy. No. Well, I mean, I could have gone in somehow. I don't know. But it was interesting because nobody could ever actually determine how do we determine an adequate education? Because adequate's not a definitive I mean, you know, you know, I would say as a, as, as a starting point, I don't know, it maybe should be the based. ability to read and well, write, and that, which, which is, which is like kind of what they, do, but, right, but that's what we do now. The state gives every student, well, the state gives schools X many thousand dollars. The point is, is that um, folks in one town want their education quality to be exactly the same as folks in another town. And prior to Claremont, each town funded their own education. Um but you're never going to have the same thing. Bedford is always going to be able to offer more, or Wolfboro is going to offer more than Allenstown. Unless the people in Allenstown want their property taxes to go up because they just are a property poor town. So basically, my opinion of this, because I have one, is um, this new Education Funding Commission is just a way to um, try to drive home making the state have to can totally control all of the education and the funding, which will only make it more expensive as we'll show through everything else we talk about today. Um, And it'll probably make it more dysfunctional. Um, Ironically, there's a, it's a 16 person commission. There's only one Republican on it. Yeah. That sounds like that's going to come out. That sounds, you know, that representative of the people. Right. Um, What I did find, there was two articles that I read. And um, what was interesting is they refer to a Cheshire County Superior Court judge who says we shouldn't be over relying on property tax, which during my days back at New Hampshire Advantage Coalition, it was important to remind people that those gentlemen in the black robes on the other side of the city, on the other side of the river, those are not elected people. They do not actually represent you. They do not get to legislate from the bench. That's not how it works. Um, Although they obviously try to, right? (laughs) But I thought it was funny. There's a quote. The the distribution of a resource as precious as educational opportunity may not have its determining force be the mere fortuity of a child's residence. And I thought, oh, so we should have more school choice because we shouldn't be basing a child's education solely on their residence. So which is it, folks? Yeah, so, and and maybe- And then these people, the people, um, there was another quote from um, Jay Kahn, who's a Democrat from Keene, who said, there's a number of funding levels that need to be addressed and suggested recommending a number of models so people don't feel handcuffed to a single solution, which I'm sorry, folks, is an income tax. Um, that is the Democrat solution. Um, but ironically, this guy voted not to accept the federal money for the charter schools, which are public schools. So which is it, folks? You're either for the public schools or you're not for the public schools. You're for the kids. You're not for the kids. Well, yeah. I think at this stage, really what we're seeing, um, and, and I think this is a fair statement, is that 
uh, these people are not actually acting in the best interests of students no. or education. They are uh, acting in a partisan fashion, yes. and they are acting on behalf of the unions, yes. which is an entirely different, different discussion. That's a different conversation, right. right? Right. And and there are definitely things that need to change. But yeah. if we think that in New Hampshire we're spending 60, 70 percent of the taxes that you pay on your property are going to schools. Right. In New Hampshire, we're spending about six. $15,000 per student. So think about that per year. So, and what are we getting in return? So you could basically take a student, mm -hmm. give, them give them a $250,000 house and be like, here you go. You don't actually need an education. Just take this house I, and go. I mean, <laughs> I, my point is, and I know I'm comparing apples to oranges, but the point is, you know, there's, there's all this Waste. I mean, there's yeah. nothing it's else not, to call nobody, it. Nobody, in, if, in, nobody is uh, being honest if they can actually say, we actually believe that education is being run as efficiently and effectively as we could possibly get for the money that we're spending. So, no, but anybody who says that is not being honest. So, so let me ask you something. Like, what would you do? Like, I've often thought, okay, if I was just like, you know, I have my Carla's right. magic wand. Carla gets to pick. <laughs> Like, what would I do? And I'm not 100% sure I know. I have I, the first thing I would do is I would, I, right? would do, I would attach all funding to the student. Let's okay. start with that. All right. Because that will help each student get the education they need. So, so and X that will create child, competition. So right. That creates also if an Manchester's, incentive right. for parents to get involved who should and be more involved right. to actually go, well, I get, let's just make the math easy. Let's say I 15 get, grand. Like, Let's just say ten. Okay, grand, let's make it I even think easier. We could cut it by a third. Okay, easily. ten grand per student. So ten grand per student goes, and that parent and the, her their children yep. can decide. Gee, I'm a like artsy learner. I, I can think go to this school would be good yep. for me, or you know, I'm really mechanical. This will work better for me, or I'm not sure what I am. Right. So here's this. Solution. Or maybe some parents just won't care, and they'll just p say, "Go over there to the corner school because." I don't care. Go wherever you want, kid. I mean, there are some parents who just don't seem to and, get involved. And and I think that to some extent that is how it works yeah. now. Right? And then that like on the flip side would just create competition because now I mean there'd that, be when I say how it works, I just mean there are some parents who just are like, send their just, kids to school. You know, you know, not, nobody they don't get involved. They right. don't. They're not. Yeah. They're not day in day out involved in their kids' education. It, but I look at you know and like what you're saying is that the parents and the students would decide that this is what I need. And then all of a sudden, instead of there just being maybe one option, all of a sudden somebody else will be like, well, I can do that. So now you'll have art school number one who says, well, there's $10,000. We're going to do 10. We're gonna, we charge $12,000. So the parents are going to have to pay 2000 right. or you'll have to get a scholarship or whatever. And somebody else is going to come along and say, I can open a uh, just as good of an art school for and I'll do it for 10 grand. Right. So that I, and I, you can pick and choose. And somebody will be like, no, we're going to go to school A. We like it there. We like the location. Other people are going to be like, nope. I'm good with school B. And then the A and B will compete with each other. Right now, you've got students competing with the schools. That's what it feels like. The parents and the families are competing with the unions. That's not the kind of competition we need. Well, and it's also just, I mean, we know that competition actually creates better outcomes, right? Because it it puts the right incentives in place mm -hmm. where people go, actually, I have to improve. Right. I, can't just I can't just rest on my laurels. I can't just, you know, be the crappy middle. I've right. got to be like a little exceptional or I've got to come up with something, some kind of bell and whistle, maybe a different service. Maybe you have a longer school right. day that maybe works you have a shorter parents. school day and a long, you go all year. Who but knows? This concept that after a hundred plus years, nothing Has should change no. and that we are just going to double down on bad ideas. And actually by its very outcome, we're, we're actually like introducing <laughs> More, more and more bad ideas yeah. because we've eliminated this concept of competition. And, you know, I'm a big proponent that it shouldn't, your education should not depend on how wealthy you are. No. And so if you care about poor children or people who need help, right. the market is actually the best right. way to help those kids because, as I said, it drives the price down. And when the price goes down, things become more affordable for everyone. Yep. So my magic wand, actually my magic wand might even be that 
you pay for your kids when you have right. your kids, and then you're done, so that we don't also have this well, situation. Well, I would I would agree with part have, of that. We have know, seniors. We have paying. seniors who are paying. You know, their kids have been out of school for fifty years, and they're being forced out of their homes because they can't pay their property right. taxes because their property taxes. Well, keep I mean, going but because and you'll always see the, that because expensive. people have the free concept. But maybe over maybe some competition would make people realize that these things aren't free because you you get pushed back even if you say well kids should have to pay to play sports and parents are like oh yeah you know, we shouldn't right, have to pay but, to play and I'm but like you but know what? if you maybe want you do to learn parents should be responsible there's this amazing thing called the internet yep. it literally <laughs> could be free and and, and <laughs> parents I mean I've always said I just think parents should have to be take some responsibility for their kids' education. You know, and whether that's financial, you know, like well, I know people who've had kids in Catholic schools, right, or religious school. I mean, I'm, I presume Catholic, but whatever. I mean, for years that was the only alternative. I think was you know public school, Catholic school, and um, you know they'd have to pay for those that education. And a lot of those parents would volunteer their time working in the schools. You know, they were the lunch ladies and they were right. the secretaries and stuff to offset the cost of their kids' education and. Is that a bad thing that parents have, you know, no, are put, I think no. It's, well, as long as it's voluntary, right? It, as right, long as, as long as we're not, like, like, enslaving you to you work know, in, you know, don't, beach don't street make it school. mandatory. <laughs> Just let people choose. Right what they want <sighs> in life. I mean, just think about the hubris of the government, because I know we're going to yeah. go to something else that's about yeah. to make me very, very <laughs> angry, I'm sure. But it's just, you know, it's this idea of, oh, we're going to force, this is the government in a nutshell. We're going to force everyone to do X. Badly. So the question <laughs> becomes, sh how many things should that go? apply to in right. my book it should apply to as little, little as, as possible. possible i agree because if you're saying we're gonna make everyone do this thing then like it's got to be like really important stuff right. it can't be all right. the things right so before i even bring up this next article i'm gonna put a little like <laughs> one of those little things like when i say we don't hate the police so i live on varney street and the i live between two multi-family homes right I live in a single family home surrounded by two. Um, on one side, I think there's four apartments and, you know, maybe eight people live there. I really don't know. It's not my business. On the other side is actually a boarding house. Okay. Or a rooming house or whatever we call it, um, which has been grandfathered in. Okay. If I didn't know that, I would never know that. Yeah, in fact, I They are know, wonderful I neighbors know. and a, the property's clean. There's no noise. Like, they're the best. They're fine. I've lived next to tons of people. I'll pick them. Right. Just want to say that. So when people think that, like, well, you have no idea what we're talking about. I live next to a rooming house. So um, there was a meeting in Ward 2 up in the North End um, about sober houses. Because apparently there's a house on Russell Street and then also now one on Orange Street. And Chief Goonan's saying there's maybe 50 to 60 sober homes, sober houses in our city. And the brouhaha over that. And I, when I first read it, I thought, okay, so we have people trying to help other people get sober. Okay, should, the governor should definitely get in the middle and muck that up. We can't be having people helping people. Well, let's start with, I, I was surprised when I read there were that many. Right, and, and then, how do we not? And then, and then I, but, mm, but then I was like, oh, no, follow the money. See, when we talk about... Oh, the inefficiencies of the government, right? So there was a lot of money when, when you know, when we started talking about the opioid situation mm -hmm. as an epidemic right. and like all the fear mongering, don't, don't, don't language. Don't get me wrong. It's genuinely an issue, right? But we're talking about, you know, between 200 and 300 people who died at the peak of it. Right, right. Right. It's actually been going down now for, for a couple of years. Um, no, now they're saying last year's statistics show it's up again. Really? Uh, deaths was... are up. How is it? Deaths I... are up. More Narcan. Personal use of Narcan is up. Um, it's just really weird. It's just. But anyway, so there was, a, there was a huge flood of money that actually yes. went into stuff where we know based on things that have happened in the past. You have to that the, justify it. Well, and, and that the, the, the control mechanisms aren't really there, yeah. right? So people were going, oh, there's a market opportunity here. There's this money. I'm going to start this thing. I'm going to assume, you know, 98% of those people have yep. the best of intentions yep. and they're really trying to help people. Right. But, you know, sometimes yep. there's, you know, people. Yep. So now we have these 60 or 70 sober homes. And God only knows what they're, what the 
fire chief is saying constitutes a sober house. So my understanding is how they actually figured out this was happening as as we have these every three year property inspections, mm -hmm. right? Right. I think the police, uh, uh, the fire department went into a place and then they were like, oh, wait a second. Like, what, are people rooming yeah. here? Is this a family yeah. living together in this house? Are these, you know, like, well, and then they started to go have, down this. Well, this and, I, and years ago, there used to be a law in New Hampshire that said um, there could only be so many people living in one unit that weren't. Relate, related, and that's been changed. There, that requirement is no longer there, which a lot of people don't realize. Um, it, basically, anybody, any group of people that are living as a family, and that's a you know not really the appropriate term, but for the lack of a better term, which basically means you're all living, you know, as a group in a home, Together. right? Yeah. Um, and what I'm the way I took this was so you've had mm -hmm. got an organization don't from based in Maryland that in Concord provides treatment for those trying to get, recover from whatever addiction, right? And they purchased this house at 70 Russell Street and a bunch of people are living there. There is no treatment being provided there. I guess a shuttle comes and picks them up in the morning, takes them to Concord for treatment. Basically they eat and sleep and look for a job while living at 70 Russell Street. And then they bought a house on Orange Street and the same thing. And it really does kind of, you know, I get it. I don't want my neighbor, I don't want to live in a neighborhood that isn't what I bought into. However, how is this any different than eight other people? A family of eight can, you know, is it because they're, they're struggling with addiction that you don't want them up in the North End? Or is it because you don't like the way they're choosing to live together? And is this really where I want the government to step in and say, you can live with that person, but they can't, can't live with each other. Right. And it is it's a little weird. So then the, it gets worse. Well, it gets different. So <laughs> then I see based from this article and there, look, there's this nice picture of this nice man who said, you know, these, this one of these sober houses basically saved his life. Yep. You know, um, the fact that they've had, there have been calls for overdoses to either of those homes to me is irrelevant because there's been overdose calls to just about every place in, in Manchester. Um, so then I was reading, there's a bill maybe with the right intention, but I hate the government house bill 311 <laughs> put in by Manchester reps, um, Erica Connors, Pat Cornell and Jeff Goley, who happens to be a firefighter, by the way, um, saying like to, it says it's to exempt that they, they could apply for permission to be exempt from some of the fire code, meaning sprinklers. But then when you look at, this is the stuff that would still apply. And this is where I was like, come on, we have too much government and they screw everything up. <laughs> These are the things that would not be able to be exempted. A properly maintained electrical system, that's okay. fair. A maintained heating system, including one hour fire separation. Don't know what that is, but whatever. Maintained cooking appliances, reasonable. Street number of recovery house posted and visible from street. Okay. No smoking within 10 feet of building unless approved by the local fire department. I'm like, what? So people, so somehow this house is going to be more dangerous because people smoke. What? Outside. <laughs> A written evacuation plan submitted to and approved by the local fire department. So this group of people have to have a plan, but a family of 10 doesn't. Okay. Just so you know. Uh, monthly evacuation drills must be conducted <gasps> yeah, with documentation right available for review on site. Basement living spaces should have an exit directly to the gate. That's already a, a uh, existing long. law. Facilities shall have a minimum of 200 gross square feet per resident. That math starts to make it a little difficult because if it's a 1,500 square foot house that has three beds. Well, that's probably yeah. where it's like, oh. Okay, so but this... okay. At least one escape window in each sleeping room. Installed interconnected smoke and carbon monoxide alarms electrically powered with battery backup on each level and in each sleeping room or installation of a complete fire alarm system. Annual compliance inspection by the local uh, fire department. And if the travel distance to an exit is greater than 75 feet, there needs to be two means of egress from each floor. So... That's a lot for the government to put on anybody. Well, that's also some of it's where, reasonable, some of it's just ridiculous. But you see, here's here's where I get back to property rights, right? So if it's your property and you own it, you should be able to do with it right. what you want, oh, right? It does and, not and, how it works. 
And I mean, you and I actually, I think, differ a little bit because uh, I think you like more of a covenant or like if you buy into it, you just said, right. if, if I bought into this neighborhood and to I a, like this to a degree, of this neighborhood. To a degree. I can't control what color paint my neighbor puts on this thing. But if he puts 16 vehicles in his front yard that aren't registered, then maybe I can say something. I but mean, I think I'd probably just try to put pressure on in the neighborhood before the government had right, to Right, because the question is, okay, now we write this law. Now what have we done? We've created I know. another I know. category I, I, of something that someone has to yep. manage, look at, understand. And so from there, what happens is you create this mass government inertia. No one does anything and no one can make any decisions about anything because there are too many laws. Well, and that you so can't possibly like know. everyone's scared of being like, oh, I think this is how it works. Right. And everyone's just kind of like, I, I don't, don't know. know. Well, and then you see things like zoning where it's like, oh my goodness, it took four years to build right. something. But why do we have a housing right, shortage? Right. Why don't we have affordable housing? Ah, maybe because we are over-regulating everything. Well, that's like, I, I, we're not going to have enough time to talk about the whole um, why we're driving up the price of rents in New Hampshire, uh, maybe next week. Um, but I did read also in the paper today, and I was like, oh, I think I like this. And I know what the arguments are about school costs and everything. Um, uh, Brady Sullivan wants to build a 160-unit apartment building behind Velcro, so between Velcro and the river. It's so funny because I walk there all yeah. the time. I like to walk from the west yeah. side and go over and yeah. then past Elliot down yeah. under the bridge. There's always interesting graffiti yeah. back there. Uh, you know, it's- And there's and, a and strange like stretch that. of land. And and so when you get right to the end of it, there's this, uh, yeah, there's this it's, open right behind- yeah. Right there. Yeah. And it's like, and you look at it and go, what the heck's going well, on? Well, I've this? always gone, why is this here? Is here? Because this is pretty yeah. real estate. And then it, and the then river, it open, and then it connects to um, Dunbar Street, which right. has single and family, multi family. And then family home. neighborhood down there is actually quite quick. Right. So yeah. it's like, okay, so they want to build 160 units, which everybody's going to complain. It's going to cost us too much money because the tax, the school costs are retarded uh oops i said that word <laughs> school prices are out of control and ridiculous um it actually is a word um but what's interesting is i'm dying to hear the the, the pushback because we have a sh housing shortage we know this and my theory is if you create more up upper end higher value units what happens is these people move in them and then these units become available and then these people move in them right. and it just all shifts and maybe it ends up at the bottom that those really, really, really bad apartments need to do something because it's competition to get people to move into them. So yeah, You know what's a really fair system of doing the, the things, The free market. People? It's just the works. Free market. It works. <laughs> um, so this is going to be 122 bedroom, two bed if they if it gets approved. And I, uh, that's another thing I'll be curious to watch how many years it takes for these developers to develop a, an underused property that's blighted and it's not, not the prettiest thing in a part of the city that it won't impact anybody negatively, um, where it will be generating 122 bedroom, two bath units, two 23 bedroom, two bath units, 15 two bedroom, one bath units, and five one bedroom, one bath units. Interesting about the two bedroom, two bath is they talk about it's meant, they're developing for it roommates. for roommates. Yeah. So while the rents are expected to be probably 17 to 1900, probably for those three bedroom or maybe those two bedroom, two baths, that when you split that down the middle, we're talking under a thousand dollars for somebody to live in an upscale on condo river. on the river. So easy access to the highways. I mean, that's really wait till primo, primo just wait. real estate. This is good. People are gonna be like, "This is awful." What but, about the poor people? And why are we building expensive houses? And when we can build ones that don't cost anything and it's all free? Because you know, because it doesn't work is that way. Magically free. free. If everything could just be free, why isn't it already? Right. Um, so next week, I'd love to talk to you about why rents are so high and some of the stupid legislation that's in <laughs> state house. Um, I wanted to mention yes. one quick yes. thing uh, for people who are interested in sort of better understanding what's happening yes. in Iran right Ooh. now, foreign policy, um, Tulsi Gabbard, yeah. who is running for president uh, on the Democratic ticket, will be speaking tonight at NHTI in Concord from 6 to 9 p.m., uh, or 6 to 8 p.m., I believe. I thought, uh, you know, for yep. the people who might see yeah. this, it's uh, uh, on Facebook at least, you know, it might be worth going to see that. She yeah. um, 
is fairly anti-war. I mean, I'm obviously a card-carrying Republican at this stage, <laughs> but for people no, but who it's, are it, wondering it's good, or who are or interested just in for the information. primary, you know, or just information about what's going on um, in Iran. And uh, and then I thought it was cool. There were two Oscar-nominated movies I that both that, have a New England sort of New Hampshire yeah. thing. The one is The Lighthouse, which I guess is like two lighthouse owners who have a fight. Oh, no. And, uh, and that sounded interesting. And then uh, a documentary also nominated for an Oscar called The Cave, huh. which also has a New Hampshire connection. Mm, so interesting. Have to check those movies, out. Check those out. Um, I did want to... Speaking of, for those on watching on Facebook, um, Manchester Republican Committee meets tomorrow night, Wednesday the 15th at Murphy's Tap Room. We do social at 6, um, meeting at 6.30. We're out of there by 7.30. If you go to Murphy's before 6 o'clock, they have half price appetizers. So come on in, have a, a, a dozen wings, grab a beer, get to see meet some um, like-minded Republican independent type peoples. Um, I also wanted to mention, because I think Dan and I are going to do this and you won't be able to because you'll be at the Right to Know meeting. Yes. Uh, Winter <laughs> Bird Walk this, this Saturday, the 18th, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. at the New Hampshire Audubon Society Center in Auburn. Um, it is, I think... $12 for members, $15 for non-members. They're going to go through and um, spend some time outside, inside discussing binoculars, few key to bird identification, then head outside to see what we can find. I just thought it sounded like a good reason to be outside. I know. I, actually, when um, you sent me yep. that, I was like, oh, I want to go. And I realized I it. So um, we'll see. Well, If it's going to snow, I might not go, but I think I'll probably go. Um, I also think I'm going to join the New Hampshire Audubon Society. So. I know. I mean, we go up to And I'm going to join the career. The so there you go. Yes. Look at us. Uh, that's all I got. Um, Hopefully it doesn't, it's, it, somebody said it's like lotto, 12, t we're going to like pull out temperature balls, 12, 40, 60, 32, <laughs> it's, to snow it's all over the place, night, so right? who knows. Wednesday That's through right. Thursday, I it's think It's winter, it's January, snow. it's going to happen. I mean, I wouldn't mind some snow now, yeah, okay. now that it's all Now melted. that it's all clean? Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> we'll be back next week. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye.